everyone, before we get started with the panel, the Early Careers Dramaturg's Lunch will be in Osher A. We are going to meet in the circle area and go to Berkeley Bowl, then go to Osher A. So after this session. Okay. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. How are you? Last day of the conference. Still going strong. Good job, everybody. You're all doing great. Um, welcome. Uh, my name's Ilana Brownstein. I'm the director of new work at Company One Theater, and I'm on the faculty at the Boston University School of Theater. And um, here's what we're doing here today. No need to consult your uh, packets. I will tell you what this is. Um, this round table or linear panel uh, will explore how and why responsive theater gets made. Examples of this genre include things like, but are not limited to, the Every 28 Hours Project, the Orlando Project, Ghostlight Project, etc. What challenges are posed by the emergence of this form of immediate social emergency style work? What do best practices look like? How do we amplify and innovate the great work being done in this field? Surely we are more in need of effective, immediate, responsive theater actions now than ever before. Um, and I have this amazing group of panelists up here with me, and I'm going to remind us as we're up here that we'll want to speak directly into the mic so that we can be really well heard. Um, access for everybody. And uh, I want to say hello to our friends at HowlRound and all the folks who are watching us from afar. So I'm going to go through and introduce our panelists really quickly. Um, I have tried to distill their intense accomplishments into just a uh, hundred words each, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'll start, start here with Diane. This is Diane Brewer. She's a professor of theater history and criticism at the University of Evansville. She serves as the department's resident dramaturg and directs text-based and ensemble-generated productions. She has actively developed new work in venues such as Primary Stages, the Tofty Lake Center, the Mark Taper Forum, among others. She's a founding ensemble member and performer with In the Mix, an Evansville-based company dedicated to the collaborative development of new work. She has received the Dean's Teaching Award from the University of Evansville and a Certificate of Merit for Dramaturgy from the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. Welcome, Diane. Um, next to Diane. <coughs> Pardon me. We have Rebecca Stretch. Did I pronounce that correctly? Struck, my apologies. Um, Rebecca is a theater artist, cultural field worker, and educator with a commitment to participatory practice in arts, education, research, and civic engagement. She currently works at the Stanford Arts Institute. In 2014, she launched Stagecoach, a two-year community-based uh, participatory theater program at the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. At their first, as their first community producer, she worked to integrate the ethics and practices of theater and pedagogy of the oppressed into many parts of the organization. While there, she co-developed and co-taught the first citizen artist training program for the MFA acting students and led the development of three community devised productions with local partners. Welcome. Uh, next up, we have Phaedra, uh, Phaedra Scott, who I hope you guys heard this morning talking about the Black Theater Commons, which is like freaking amazing. So I'm so excited about that. Uh, so Phaedra Scott is a Boston-based director, dramaturg, and writer. Phaedra has been a part of the artistic departments at Cleveland Playhouse, Huntington Theater Company, and Company One Theater. She recently directed She, a Choreo play in New York. She has produced and directed Every 28 Hours in collaboration with Company One Theater and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Her recent dramaturgy credits include Salt Lake Acting Company's Playwriting Workshop, Huntington Summer Workshops, The New Harmony Project, and The Boston Project with Speakeasy Stage. She's the recipient of the Bly Creative Capacity Grant and the, oh gosh, I can't pronounce this, Comegus? Comegus. Oh, Okay, Comegis Bite Fellowship. Thank you for that. Uh, and the Frederick Douglass Fellowship for her work in on August Wilson's Pittsburgh Cycle. Um, next to Phaedra, we have, hold on, this is a late addition to the panel, so I need to pull this up on my email. Great. Uh, we have Joan Hurwitt. Hi, Joan. Um, who you might recognize from being a volunteer at the conference, doing great work. Joan is a creative professional in the arts, education, and community engagement. 
She works as a director and dramaturg in LA. Her interest in responsive theater was peaked in 2007 when San Diego battled nine raging wildfires and thousands of people were evacuated to Qualcomm Stadium. She organized a responsive theater effort to perform for evacuees in an effort to relieve any amount of anxiety and distress. With a background in emergency relief, she continues to be fascinated with natural disasters and wonders how national response organizations like the Red Cross might support or collaborate with future arts relief efforts. Thank you for joining us, Joan. And then finally, at the end of our linear roundtable, we have Allison Carey. Um, Allison is the director of Oregon Shakespeare Festival's American Revolutions, the United States History Cycle, a multi-decade program of commissioning and developing 37 new plays about moments of change in United States history, including All the Way by Robert Schenken and Sweat by Lynn Nottage. Uh, she is the co-founder of Cornerstone Theatre Company, which collaborates with communities across the U.S. to tell their stories. Her work has been produced in venues such as Arena Stage and a dirt floor cattle sale barn. Right on. Um, she lectures frequently on the importance of the arts in shaping healthy societies, especially focused on how theater can most effectively respond to climate change. So um, I want to tell you why I um, asked this illustrious panel of folks to join us and why I wanted to have this conversation with you. Um, but I want to first clearly state that none of us will have the answers to any of the questions that have been posed. I'm really interested in a conversation with people who are approaching this topic from different entry points, different levels of power and decision making, and different levels of expertise and interest. As a moderator, um, I'll expressly be looking to identify and highlight threads of connection between what the panelists are saying, and then try and turn these provocations out towards you, the audience, for your response and your input and ideas for revision. My inspiration for proposing this topic was that we are wrestling with how to include responsive programming in our season structure at Company One. Um, we've tried a bunch of different approaches. We produced every 28 hours and some other things. And each of those approaches has had its pros and cons. For us at Company One, um, we, uh, the way we think about responsive programming is um, its use is how we demonstrate our commitment to social justice and advocacy through our art and how we demonstrate our ability to serve our community in ways most beneficial to our community. Um, so we're deeply committed to this process, but even so, I still feel unsure about exactly how to do it successfully, responsibly, ethically, and with artistic merit. So I wanted to know how other people are approaching it. And in this dramaturgical spirit, I want to create space for a conversation that meets the audience where we all are. So there will be a wide range of familiarity with this topic in this room and online. Um, some are experts. Some uh, might be totally new to this idea of responsive programming. And I don't think it's our job up here or your job to convince anybody that you need to do responsive programming. But perhaps we can begin to come to some jointly understood definitions of the form, identify its unique challenges and opportunities, and share some strategies for success. So that's why we're all here. Thank you for being part of it with us. Um, we had some conversations before meeting up today, and some themes arose from oops, are some themes arose from the conversations uh, about what these panelists were concerned about in terms of this question of responsive programming, and they kind of like coalesced into a couple of different categories. Um, one category has to do with the flexibility or inflexibility of an institution's and, and its desire to do responsive programming. So. Um, how do you make something happen in a, in a structure that might not be set up for that? Um, another category has to do with who makes it. Um, not just the theater companies or the organizations and their dominant identities, but also its openness and availability as a grassroots model that allows for students or um, unaffiliated artists or members of fringe scenes or people who are not artists at all to become part of this work. We actually were also talking about the notion of audience and ethics. So whose stories are centered in these actions? Um, are they actually part of the creation process? Uh, how do we encounter and handle issues of tokenism? And uh, can the audience even be the generative body for this work? And then we had some questions about action steps, takeaways, and impact. How do you measure that? What happens next in a community? What happens next in an organization? Um, and is it just a one-off? So 
those are like the big areas that we are going to try and touch upon in this moment. So I wanted to um, invite the panelists first to spend a couple minutes uh, describing some of these responsive theater actions, because I don't want to assume that everybody knows what these things are by their acronyms. So um, first, I think, Phaedra, you were going to take on Every 28 Hours. Can you talk about that? Yes. Uh, so Allison, please jump in as well. Um, so Every 28 Hours started at Oregon Shakespeare Festival in tandem with the One Minute Play Festival. Uh, and so what it is is a series of 81 minute plays. Of, or it's a series. Of oh, yeah. So Up every there. 28 hours is a series of 81 minute plays around the theme about the contested statis statistic that every 28 hours uh, a person of color is killed by police or a security force of some sort. Um, it was rolled out into three different phases, and I believe it's in phase three right now. Yep. Um, and uh, the first phase was reaching out to the national playwriting community of like, hey, can you write this one minute play? And so there's a lot of wonderful playwrights that are involved in this from many walks of life and uh, different perspectives. Um, and then phase two, I believe, was the national outreach. Yeah, okay. so which is what we were, a company one was a part of. Um, and I was the artistic producer from, from the Boston one. Uh, and so in that phase two, different regions were put, put the play on. And so it was a part of a national conversation about talking about police brutality, but using it in a way of, of art and in, in community engagement. Allison, do you want to um, take a minute to talk about the climate change theater action? Sure. Um, it was uh, an earlier than every 28 hours, but not at all dissimilar. Hi, Leslie. Um, apparently, you were involved with it. <laughs> um, uh, it was a series of plays. Uh, Chantal Bilodeau and Caridad Svitch put it together. Um, short plays looking at the uh, climate crisis from an international lens, so international uh, playwrights from all over the world. And theaters could participate or non-theaters could participate in reading and uh, producing one or more of these short plays. And at OSF, we performed one of them. Universe has actually performed it um, at a gathering of all the local climate organizations um, at, as sort of a way of bringing art into a conversation that is often not seen through an artistic lens, but rather a scientific and political lens. Great, thank you. Um, Diane, you were going to talk about the um, Ghost Light Project, right? Do you want to talk about that? Thank you. Uh, yeah, the Ghost Light Project was a um, project where uh, a, a bunch of different theaters from across the country could engage in a ritual. Uh, a f it was a flexible ritual. There was, there was a structure that was offered that each institution could could adapt, uh, whereby you establish your theater as a sanctuary and uh, read a statement or have music. That was part of what we did. Uh, and then you leave the ghost light on. Um, you just come together as a community to uh, announce yourself as a sanctuary. Great, thank you. And I, I also think um, that was, I think it's important to note that that was on Inauguration Eve, I think, is that right? It was on Inauguration Eve, and the idea was um, to that, that participating groups were in some way trying to pledge their commitment to, um, to protecting some core values. Um, and then we have uh, something like the After Orlando Project, which um, was uh, produced by Missing Bolts Productions and No Passport Theater Alliance. Uh, it was a response to the Orna Orlando Pulse nightclub shooting in 2016 and comprised 70 plays and over 40 organizations that produced that theater action uh, nationwide. So um, uh, hopefully that gets us all situated in what we mean when we say responsive theater. But certainly these examples are not all inclusive. There are lots of different ways to conceive of this definition. And I think one of the things that will be great is as we open this up to a bigger conversation in the room, um, if you have a strong idea or a question about a different way we could define this term, I think it would be great to hear it. Um, but I want to start because all of you have had um, various interactions with this form. And I'd love to start with um, each of you talking about a success that you've had, something that, that you can um, identify as something replicable, maybe, maybe not, um, but something that you feel like the, the, the form allowed you to do something that you felt was important. Um, and I don't mind who starts. Maybe you could popcorn around. And I would love to start. Um, so specifically with Every 28 Hours, what was really wonderful about the project was the flexibility. Um, specifically for the Boston version of this, we engaged with four different other institutions, including Harvard University, um, a 
Performing Arts High School, Boston Arts Academy, as well as the Theater Offensive, which is a LGBTQ uh, community organized theater, or community based theater, as well as uh, Company One. And what we had discovered during it when we were distributing the plays, uh, it was brought up by the Theater Offensive. They were like, by the way, there are 81 minute plays and only one LGBTQ voice. Um, and so uh, I talked to Claudia. I was like, would it be okay if we developed our own section of queer voices for this one minute play? this one minute play festival? And the answer was an overwhelming yes. Uh, and so for, it, like, it was a huge success to have like this very Boston based, but queer community one minute play section of every 28 hours. That's great, thank you. Anybody else wanna take this question? Yeah, I'll add to that just because it's also related to every 28 hours. Um, so I uh, produced the every 28 hours plays at the American Conservatory Theater two days after coming back from phase one in Ferguson and St. Louis. And a success that I don't know is replicable, but I think is worth putting out there because I think it's what allowed us to do it within two days was being able to build on pre-existing programs that already exist at your institutions. So I had the privilege of running the Citizen Artist program at ACT and having this community-based program, which I know not every theater has. Um, but being able to tap into those pre-existing networks and say, okay, we're gonna do this within two days because we have to respond right now. Who do we already know who's doing this work around the community? Um, and so similar, we similarly to Phaedra, we built a bunch of quick partnerships. Well, we didn't build them, but we re-engaged them, connected them, because we already had them, um, with activists all over the Bay Area, Oakland um, and San Francisco predominantly, those two cities. Um, and had a huge resource fair that was the like pre-show of the show where all these organizations could come and talk about the work that they were already doing. We had youth voices present. Um, we had community members who had participated in previous projects who came out. Um, and then we, we did a very rapid reading of the show with the MFA students from, from ACT. So being able to just plug into what already existed and use it as a springboard to bring people together I thought was really successful and the flexibility of the project allowed us to do that um, and, and just get disparate voices who are operating in different corners but doing similar work, get them all together in the same room. Um, and so that, that was one success. So this is uh, similar to using uh, platforms and structures that are already out there, but I recently came off a year long nationwide research project loosely based on my graduate work from years ago on art as therapy or art is healing, and finding uh, different ways that different communities use the arts, with a capital A, to address trauma or to serve communities in distress. And that scope of trauma ranged from gun violence or social justice issues or natural disasters. And so I worked uh, closely with a lot of arts organizations who were using their art to talk to the community about current events and, and um, relevant issues, but I also got to uh, shadow and observe aid-based organizations who were using their arts programming to help their clients process trauma. So a lot of uh, homeless centers and domestic violence women's shelters among many. So it was really interesting to see how different uh, types of organizations were, what was working, what was not working, and then returning to Los Angeles after having you know, gone on that whole adventure to create a program based on some of my favorite parts of those different programs, and then also addressing where we could kind of fill in the blanks and um, and make sure that all those voices were being heard and uplift the the um, the stories that had not yet been shared. So right now we're uh, so I created a program called Trust. It stands for the Therapeutic Relief of Unearthing Stories Together. It's definitely community devised work. So we're teaming up with. Uh, a women's shelter to um, start very early stages of starting production on those works. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess what I would, um, uh, I echo what everybody else is saying. Uh, the best way to do responsive theater is to have social justice part of all the work that you do, right? Because then there's nothing new. It's all just a continuation of your mission. Um, and what I would say is we've done, uh, been involved in uh, all these projects to a certain extent. The thing that I think uh, is sits at the heart of OSF's belief in this work is that we hire activists to run our programs. Mm. Um, and if you don't, so that the people who are suddenly called to do this work already have the skills and the life tradition of engaging that way. And if you do not consider yourself an activist at this time in your life, it's time you learn because um, we do not, none of us has the, uh, sort of moral right to step back at this point. Um, and so 
the more that we are, are all in the habit of doing this every day, the more it will happen, and with ease, and with honor, and with respect, and with grace. Great. Um, Diane, I, I know, <laughs> yes. Diane, I know that you are in the process of sort of developing some ideas. Do you want to talk about um, sort of what that's looking like for you right now? Um, he kind of. <laughs> okay, you do you. <laughs> okay, it's hard not to. Um, uh, I guess I I, I want to respond a little bit to to what I'm hearing in terms of the the relationship between the institution and what the institution does on a daily basis, and what kind of position that puts you in when you know maybe social justice is a part of the value statements of the university. But it isn't, it isn't necessarily at um, visibly at the center of everything that we do on a daily basis. So I think the, the um, circumstances that I find myself in at, at the institution is, is um, how do we, I, I like what you said about, about you know, what structures are there that exist. So, so I often find that my role at the institution is when students come to me with ideas that, that I, I have a responsibility to help them figure out how to activate those ideas. So, so for example, our participation in the Ghost Light Project was entirely student driven and ultimately faculty and institution supported. But, but it meant that a student had to come to me and say, I really wanna do this. Can you help me make it happen? And then it was just about it was just a matter of, you know, finding out who can help us ask the right questions within the context of this institution, and then and then activate it. Uh, another example would be uh, students who came to me and said it, this was right before the election and said, you know, I w we're really starting to feel like bloody bloody Andrew Jackson would be a would be a interesting way of starting dialogue. Uh, so and they they wanted to do a um, reading sing through of it at a fraternity house uh, and and so they did and um, but but that wasn't it, it wasn't as easy as just saying we want to do this um, you know, because there, there there's a lot to navigate and when you're 18 you don't necessarily know how to navigate those things at an institution that's been around for almost 200 years so um, so, so there's that. There, are, there are other things that that we're addressing as well. But that that's maybe that's great. The beginning. Thank you. Um, I want to spin off from Allison what you were saying about, you know, the time is now and uh, social justice and activism can help us make these responsive theater actions more quickly. But I am also aware that responsive theater is oftentimes a way in. For um, for theaters or for groups who may not may not have any um, familiarity yet with activism and with uh, social justice, and it might be a first step. And so, I'm this may not totally relate uh, to what I'm about to ask you, but I want to sort of plant that in our minds as we continue our conversation, because I think one of the things I hope that we're going to do is both make demands on how we move forward and also acknowledge the places where people are new to to this work, but I want to ask you each to maybe also talk about a challenge that responsive programming has, has um, that you've encountered in that realm. And, and uh, if you've figured out how to deal with that challenge, great. If it's still a challenge, great. You can say that too. Um, I'd love for you guys to popcorn around and talk about that. Um, I would say that one of the challenges that we have faced is, it not so much now um, at all, but a tendency to separate one's work life from one's outside life, right? If you have an artistic staff meeting, do you talk about the news? Do you talk about climate change? Do you bring it up, right? And where there's a, I'm speaking as a white person, a tendency to, to make polite our workplaces, um, which disallows honest conversation about the most important work. Um, and I think that is a challenge in everywhere, so it's not surprising that it's also a challenge in theater realms. Um, and the other thing I would talk about a little bit is, uh, and this is a completely separate topic, is that equity 
as an equity theater, equity can be very, can require um, actors to sort of get special permission um, if they are engaged in something like a theater action, like the climate change play um, that we did. Um, you, we ha they had to get a letter from equity. It's as if actors were not allowed to be citizens outside of their equity contract if it was associated with the theater that's employing them. And I understand why equity does that. They don't want theaters to take advantage of their actors. But this is, it's a thing, right? And, and how, uh, it's a thing I encourage actors to talk to their union about to help them participate in this sort of activity. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, um, a challenge. I, I'm gonna talk a lot about institutions, but um, a challenge is that while institutions themselves may be diverse, brands are not. That's a challenge. There is a consciousness about the public presentation of a, of a, a statement that an institution makes with its every action and, and not, it's, it's, it's very difficult when individuals feel like they aren't, A, aren't represented by the institution's brand or when they feel like the, the, the institution is saying you are not representative of us or we have, usually it comes out in we have to be careful. That, that's the language around it. And that's, and that's a challenge and it's, it's not like we're not aware of it and, and not trying to be honest in our, in our daily work as we address that. It's just, it's there and it's sometimes hard to deal with. I'd love to add to that because um, I think that this type of work, in my experience, can be very unsettling within institutions because it's largely driven by some kind of political narrative, which I think all of our work is always inherently political, but maybe not always progressive. And so then when you in engage a certain radical or progressive politics in a space that maybe isn't foregrounding that right away, it's unsettling to the internal structure. Um, and I think it's a challenge and a huge opportunity. Um, and I, in the work that I did with Every 28 Hours in a couple different places, I found that to, to be consistently true. Um, but I really believe that nothing is gonna change in our society if we don't talk about the way that power operates within the spaces that we occupy. So it's not just power out there, or it's not just the police out there, but it's also our relationships, our working relationships, our family relationships, our um, all of the ways in which we interact with each other on a daily basis. So I kind of welcome the way that it's unsettling to an institution that I mi find myself a part of. You do have to, to navigate it with some uh, level of complexity and sort of be able to have a bird's eye view as much as you can um, in, in sort of pulling in the different sides and how people perceive a, a particular issue. But I found that those conversations gave me a lot of hope, even when they were frustrating and challenging, and even if I like ran home crying at the end of it or something, which you know happens. I think that um, that internal work that we do in our institutions when we produce this kind of rapid response work is part of the work. So as my like offering would be to not shy away from those complexities or to not be too scared of them, but to acknowledge that that's sort of part of why we do it, I think. It's part of why I do it. Great, thanks, Sarah, did you want to take it? Um, a, a challenge, I think, with Every 28 Hours, specifically in Boston, was space, um, mainly because we did it at the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, a very white institution with very white art in the walls. Um, uh, and the when we were talking to the museum about doing like this theatrical piece there, there was this ongoing conversation about um, exploitation. I think there's a responsibility of, of if you're going to do responsive programming, that you have a responsibility and an obligation to maintain these relationships with these communities. Um, and that if you are not doing it, then you need to call it what it is, which is exploitation. Um, and it was very clear um, that uh, during these conversations, everybody involved was like, no, we are continuing this conversation, uh, which is kind of how we got many people to the table, because we knew we had to get people who wanted to continue. Um, but uh, the the other ch challenge of, of space is that in this predominantly white institution, why we are bringing all these like beautiful black people um, to this place um, is 
why there? Uh, but part of it was driven by the centrality of the location and also the MFA's ongoing mission of really bringing in communities of color, especially after a controversy that they had a previous year of putting um, people in geisha outfits in front of a painting. Um, uh, so they, they had a lot of work to do, and we all do. Uh, so it was really great to open up those doors. Do you want to take this question? Sure. Um, so I come from a but am not currently working within an institution. So uh, it's very interesting being on the outside right now uh, and trying to work with organizations that have such an interest in doing the type of work uh, that I'm interested in doing, but navigating the uh, red tape and bureaucracy um, that I've been encountering. So that's been a personal challenge for me, but while I was traveling, it was very interesting that I would, I would find myself interviewing a lot of artistic directors and executive directors, and as soon as I noticed that I was getting even a little bit away, far away from the art itself, I made the conscious effort to get back to the artist and the work that they were doing, uh, you know, their art and, and how it is transformative in their community. And so something that you brought up that reminded me was um, my first uh, interview on the podcast that I started, which was, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the whim sort of of a project, but um, uh, was I met a trans poet of color at a uh, art gala in Seattle, Washington. And the frustrating part was that the whole issue of the art gala was on affordable art spaces and how artists cannot afford to live in unaffordable housing uh, when there are no affordable art spaces uh, anyway. And it was located in a new building in a newly gentrified part of town and all of the other artists that were speaking uh, were white and had an opportunity to explain their art and had a, um, a you know, the, and this, this poet did not. And so uh, finding those juxtapositions within this work that maybe, uh, you know, is being held up uh, as making an effort but not really doing so. Um, and then an interesting thing that I keep hearing that I'm really loving uh, throughout the conference is how we as dramaturgs uh, can hold organizations accountable and the way that I would pick out some of the organizations or theater companies that I would uh, reach out to on my research project was by their mission statement and if they are claiming to be an inclusive company if they're claiming to be a, a diverse and and doing the types of works that are, are appealing to their community and representative of their, their community that was always a very fun um, topic for me to preach as a dramaturg because I like to ask questions and um, I went to Baltimore after the riots and I met with theater companies and I said, so, so do you believe that your theater company, the ensemble, the, um, the, whole, the whole company is representative of your community? And the answer was 100% across the board from all the theaters that I interviewed was no. And then the next question was, do you think that your audience is representative of the demographic of your community, all the demographics? And the answer was always no. So being able to ask those questions and keep accountable and Poke. That's bit. great. Um, so it feels like one of the things that's really arising out of this conversation about challenges has to do with the ethics of creation and performance. And I'm wondering, um, I know several of you um, are really concerned with that and have thought a lot about that, and others um, are sort of uh, thinking in new ways about that for yourselves. I'm wondering how what's important to you, or what are the questions you're asking? I think coming off of your comment um, is really helpful. So thinking about like the ethics of trying to understand, navigate, and intervene with responsive programming. How do you guys want to talk about that? I'll just briefly say that um, a lot of the work that I do, I, it's where I see gaps and I try to address it in that way. But the first thing that I ever learned working with homeless services or with people who are you know, temporarily or currently experiencing houselessness is to never assume, yeah. is to always ask. And so I enter any um, project or organization or, or company of people that I'm with um, by asking what do you need, not assuming what they want. Great. Who else wants to take on this question of ethics and how you how you navigate that in responsive programming? I can. Um, so as part of the Every 20 Hours project, um, I worked closely with Claudia and a couple other folks to put together a 10 steps towards greater cultural humility or towards greater cultural competency for as part of the national producing guidelines packet that we gave to all the, the theaters who were participating. And that was a way for us to 
and it was a labor of love from lots of people um, to create that. And you know, sort of a few things that jump out at me that I try to always think about in my work is how are we centering the voices of the people most impacted by whatever issues we're exploring in a, in a given project. So as a white woman, I am not most closely experiencing the impacts of police brutality in this country. I know that. So how, what is my role as um, somebody who's trying to, to organize or pull together folks who are doing this work all the time and who experience, the experience those realities all the time in ways that I do not and will not in this country, um, how do we lift up those voices and enable that to be the center of the conversation? And that looks, for me, like leadership. How are those folks leading the project? Um, and, and how can we imagine leadership to not just be come and table at a, at a thing and then go away, but really at the center of it, making decisions, a decision maker on the project? Um, so I think that's one ethical piece for me is whoever's closest to the issues those folks should be making the decision about whatever we're doing, um, whether that's within your institution or organization or in the larger community that your uh, institution is situated in. Um, that's, that's one piece of it. Um, and that document is public slash, I think we can, I it's out in the world, we could maybe share it with folks because there's, I think, other really interesting stuff in there. Thanks. Anybody else want to take this ethics question? Yeah, um, audience is incredibly important because, um, again, we were at the Museum of Fine Arts and there's a certain audience that's already built into that system. Uh, and so we had decided that we are not selling any tickets for this performance until um, like noon, and the performance was at two, I believe. Yeah. Uh, because we were, we knew that if we had sold it earlier, those audiences at the MFA would have access to that, and then we'd be packing it up with people that we didn't necessarily want or like didn't necessarily think that this was for. Uh, and so this was our way of of getting communities of color to be in engaged. We also made an opportunity, like an, an obligation to ourselves to invite specific communities of color and that they were allowed to have black tickets uh, and that everybody else had to show up like the noon day of um, because we want we were specific in, in packing uh, in packing the audience right and and I think one of the things I'm just gonna pull a thread out of there just to highlight it it has to do with who uses what forms of ticketing access right so I think that's one of the things that you were talking about is how do you make sure that the standardized way that we ticket things isn't exclusionary to groups of people who might not know about how to find a ticket on the MFA website to a thing. Yeah. I also just want to add, this work should always be free, or if it's not free, then tickets, and I, this is not it. Just oh, it I know free, free yeah, I don't know, I know, I, I have assumed, yeah. but just in case, so people aren't assuming, always free, or if you're raising money, then it's like a pay what you can, and it goes to some kind of organization or somebody who's really driving this work ongoing. Um, that came up as something just as we looked around the country at producing this, so that no organization is ever, even though all, all of our organizations are likely nonprofit, still that that money doesn't go back into that, but sort of goes out into the world. Yeah, and I feel like this ethics conversation is leading really naturally into a, a conversation about the flexibility of the groups that might want to produce responsive programming the space within organizations for individuals, which I know a couple of you are concerned about, um, to spearhead or promote or propose these kinds of actions within a, an organization that maybe isn't set up to hold space in a season, for example, right? Or hold space in a, uh, a set of coursework, for example. So I'd love for us to like link maybe these two conversations. I can speak to that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, and, and I'll, I guess I'll, I'll give two examples. Uh, one is a really simple example where it was relatively easy uh, to, to be responsive uh, within a structure. Uh, and that was um, right after 45 uh, tweeted about Hamilton and about theater as a safe space. Theater should be a safe space. and. We wanted to respond. And, and actually the chair of our department came to me and he said, I think, I think we as a department need to respond to this, but I don't want to respond unilaterally from an administrative perspective. I want, to, I want the students to be involved in our response. But the only time th you know, that all of the freshmen are together is during your survey and analysis of dramatic literature class. It, this is at the end of the semester. I've got a syllabus, right? I have to, I have to decide 
do we, what do we lose if we don't have a second conversation about this play? And, and the fact of the matter is we do lose something. But, but I have to make a split decision because there's a, there's a certain urgency to the conversation. Can I give up that 45 minutes of class time? And in this case, the answer was yes. So, so that was a very well, relatively easy thing for me to do. So, so, so that's one kind of flexibility. And the, and the second kind of flexibility is, is more complicated and it involves what I think is, is again a really productive conversation with colleagues where, where we actually surprise ourselves at, at how interested we are in making sure that we're approaching our desire to be responsive ethically. And, and this was when we were season planning. And um, I know there was a really interesting article in Inside Higher Edu Education today, and it's that, that's, that's sort of related to this. Um, I won't get into that, but, but oh, this is so hard to be succinct about, but I'm just going to try. OK, day after the election, I'm going back. I do this all the time. I'm going back in order to get to where I am. OK, day after the election, um, I woke up and didn't really, really, really did not want to get out of bed. Really did not want to get out of bed. Um, and then I realized, oh, we're talking about mother courage. I guess I better get out of bed. <laughs> and, th and then something really surprising happened. Um, I did get out of bed. I think I even I, I posted on Facebook about how I was getting out of bed to go talk about Mother Courage, right? And, and one of my students, former students, said, would you please, please, please Facebook Live your class? And, and I was like, Facebook Live? <laughs> I don't know how to do that, <laughs> do you know? And then, and then I walked into class and, and, I, and I, I said, oh, isn't it so funny? Alums are asking me to Facebook Live. And the students, the students went, yeah, we could show you how to do that. Do you know? So then they set up Facebook Live, and, and we Facebook Live the class, and we just, we had our class. It was messy. It was ugly. It was not, it was definitely not a demonstration of me as awesome teacher. It just wasn't, right? And, um, but something like 600 people checked in to that class. It was so unexpected. Uh, so, so well, okay. So, so, so now I'm going to get to where I am, because uh, because another thing was that was that the students in response to that were were like, "You are a genius. <laughs> you picked this play because you knew what was going to happen, <laughs> right?" And I was like, "Ah, uh, no." <laughs> Right? <laughs> Not no. There's no world where that's true, <laughs> right? And and what I what I just kept what I kept saying was, and then they said that about every single play in the syllabus afterwards, <laughs> and I said I didn't pick a play knowing what was going to happen. I picked plays that I felt were true. That that I knew that that could be responsive, that could be reflect, could be flexible. Okay, so now I'm where we are. They're in the season planning discussion, right? And we're thinking about what are the plays that we want to choose? Are we going to choose plays that we know are directly responsive and though that are um, literally responsive, topically responsive, where the, where the words coming out of the actors' mouths are direct references to current events, and the plays where we have to negotiate the relationship between what's going on currently and the history of the play itself. And, and you know, how do you, how do you make that work? Well, what came out of that discussion for us is that we, as an academic institution, we are going to do plays that have a history. We can't just say, Please, uh, wait for our, please wait for our mic. K 
can let's can you wait for a mic, please, so that we can hear you? Here comes one up the hall. Thank you, and, and Diane, with all due respect uh, uh, for your capabilities, your training, and, and everything that the panel is is bringing up, um, and for having this panel about responsiveness. So I'm going to be responsive. Please do. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, I. I, I just want to circle back to, you mentioned Andrew Bloody Jackson. Thank and then you. just now I want to link up about, because you're an institution, you have to do these plays, and they're going to have histories. But we know now in time that when you do certain plays that communities have been traumatized by, you really have to check that. Andrew Bloody Jackson absolutely traumatized, in fact, did damage to the indigenous community, and, uh, and that sets a precedent for other marginalized groups and other uh, communities of color. So um, that's part of our research as dramaturgs now is to understand when we have uh, bodies in space that have been traumatized historically, do we do that play? Like w when uh, you gave, it sounds like you encouraged the, the students to, to explore Andrew Bloody Jackson. But at the same time, was there anybody there leading that discussion so that that full narrative came into play? And, and did you ever consult with the Native community? where that was incredibly traumatizing. Um, it, so I just want to bring that into the space because just for the sake of covering something doesn't do it anymore. It, there's just too much historical trauma. Uh, and bodies are affected. Our minds, bodies, and spirits are now ridden with disease because we carry the internalized oppression of it. And when that's perpetuated and replicated, we pay the price and we just can't anymore. And we don't want to separate from you. We want to work with you. I'm an ally here for you, and I want you to be one for me. And I just want to hope offline we have a conversation, because I'd love to support you in best practices so that we can all work together around healing and, and uh, creating all the processes we need to to forward our practices and beautiful work. Thank you very much for your comment. I appreciate it. And I want to. I want to give Diane. I want to give you just a minute. Um, I know this. There, this topic cannot be covered completely in uh, the time we have. And I want to make sure you get a chance to talk. And I also want to like make sure we open up to the whole room because this conversation includes that as well as many other things. So um, I'm gonna. I want to acknowledge the um, the space uh, for this at the moment. So do you want to? Yes. <coughs> It's hard to find exactly the right words in exactly the amount of time that I have. And oh, wow, am I feeling emotional. <laughs> um, when I read that article this morning, they mentioned bloody, bloody Andrew Jackson, uh, which was the first time that I realized that there was that part of the play. And I thought to myself, don't be an idiot. Don't bring this up. Don't talk about it. Because it's, because it, because that you are right. That was a mistake. But but what this does is it it raises the very dilemma that I'm talking about and and that and that I'm trying to get to of how we as a as an organization have are trying to deal with it. Because the reason I didn't know that is because I was being responsive in the moment, and I didn't have time to, to do the research to find out if this was the right thing to do, if this particular project was the right thing to do. What happened was I had a student who felt compelled to have a kind of conversation about democracy and, and you know a complicated conversation and and I felt that it was my role to facilitate that but as I'm doing that I don't I didn't do all of the research and then I didn't even get to go see it because 5 minutes before it started happening I was vomiting <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know? And then I moved into the rest of my life. So, so, and I know I've, this is way more than a minute. <laughs> okay, okay. So, 
So because of that, and because I am also, as a teacher, as a citizen, as a person, deeply, deeply, deeply concerned about our total intolerance in our community, in the world right now, for things that are complex, and for really looking at things from multiple angles. How do we facilitate immediacy with depth? So what we are doing and what came out of our season planning discussion is that we are going to, as an institution, simultaneously do things that we know are historically problematic, take the time to wrestle with the connection between those historically problematic things and their contemporary impact as part of our season in the way that we have always done, and then also develop a reading series that is connected to classes that we're teaching where students then have the opportunity, students across campus then have the opportunity to come into conversation and to research and come into conversation about the thing about the plays that we are reading, but it, it takes a lot fewer resources to support a reading than it does a full production. I, Allison, I see you want to say something. I just before you do, I just want to say thank you, thank you for um, being vul being vulnerable and talking about that process, and thank you for speaking to that. And I want to say that this exact moment is modeling what I'm interested in around responsive programming, which is if we believe that we're just going to get it right all the time, then we're going to walk through it without really seeing what the full topography of the moment is. And these moments of being able to speak truth to power and being able to be self-reflective, I think, are part of how we will be successful. Allison, please. And I don't disagree with anything you just said, but I, I, I want to note that Leslie uh, talked for about 30 seconds, and you talked for a very long time. And it's not, you know, in the moment, and I don't know if in your support of Bloody Billy and Andrew Jackson you read the play, but it doesn't take an enormous amount of research to <laughs> see what's in the play, right? And so if you if you didn't read the play, then that's a whole other conversation, right? And I understand, you know, I, but it also, you know, you, you you Google Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson for five seconds, and the damage to the indigenous community is ongoing and continual. Yeah. And it's so it's not sufficient, I think, at this point in the history of our country, in this point in the history of a field, to to sit in that. Right, and it's not that I I fuck up all the time, right? And I'm not, but I don't I don't I don't think I think in a moment as a white person, instead of being like willing to own your fuck up, it's no longer sufficient. You have to like, if I'm gonna fuck up, I'm gonna step out of the conversation, right? And I'm not gonna hold the power, even if I have been given the power by my institution, because there are other ways of doing it. There are there are ways of releasing your power so that you don't have the opportunity to fuck someone else's life up. Great, and as soon as you say that, I also want to open it up because I were I want to make sure we get more of this. But yes, go ahead. Thank you. I want to open this up to the room at large, and so um, I'm going to steal a couple of our mics so that we can distribute them in the audience. Great, just one? Fabulous. Um, all right, so let's, Kat, I want to actually start with Kat, if, it's, if that's okay down here, because Kat, um, we had originally talked about Kat participating in the panel, but then I asked her to be um, a first responder in a way. Yes, hi. Um, so I just, just want to say um, a, a couple of things, um, that this work falls on different bodies in different ways. Yes. Um, and so I think it's really important to to spend some time really thinking about that. 
I hear, you know, you know, contextualizing things and all of that. But I also really um, want to echo that doing it, you know, dipping the toe in, um, even with context and deep dive and really important, um, might, you know, be educational in one way, but it's going to be that and traumatizing for, for some bodies. Um, so I think that's really, really important um, to name. Uh, and I think uh, something that is, is helpful to think about that came up yesterday in the fringes conversation that featured, uh, if you weren't there, cabaret, drag, uh, circus, um, and there was one more. Burlesque, thank you so much, <laughs> which is so like weird that I missed that one because I left going, I gotta look into burlesque. <laughs> uh, uh, but expanding our definition of theater, um, right. I think that we, we are thinking about this a lot as capital T theater, uh, institutions, and also like, you know, uh, uh, capital P play. Um, and I am uh, very inspired by um, my, my hometown community of New Orleans, right? Um, uh, second lines, parades, um, different modes of performance. Uh, uh, when, I, when I talk to artists back home, uh, you know, the conversation is, well, everyone's always practicing theater, you know? Everyone just lives it. And it's not necessarily the way that we as, you know, theater practitioners here, like in this context, or those of us who are embedded in, in institutions are necessarily thinking about it. But there are other ways to, to create theater and to have performative practices that are responsive. Um, because I think when we do, uh, you know, like short, like play, whatever, it's, it's great. But oftentimes I think we end up creating problematic work because we don't spend enough time thinking about uh, what, what is actually mm. in there. I'm obsessed right now um, with tending to the politics of everything that we do. Uh, I think we're going like really super on the nose um, and it seems it has to be like about something in order to be about something but every show whether it's Christmas Carol or you know bloody bloody has a politic to it and I think so often we profess to have a certain aim and end up producing the exact opposite and feel really good about it because you know our expressed intent was whatever Anyway, those are some of the Great. things. Great, thank you for for jumping in, Kat. We've got. I want to um, let's take a. Uh, there's a question over here on the side. Over there, please. Thank you so much. Uh, over there. I want to bring attention to the idea of access as it pertains to disability and deaf community. As we sit in a building built for my community, named after a disability rights leader, it's important to think about how theater can include disabled people. I often hear the excuse, access is expensive and time consuming. Honestly, that's bullshit. I think really there is a lack of desire. I have been looking for ways to bring access and inclusion into theater makers. Consultations, conversations. As part of the dramaturgy of play making, when we help a theater team build the world of a play. How can we make that world designed to be follow the principles of universal design.
Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, I just want to jump back to what Kat was saying about fringe artists. Yes, I should know to eat the mic. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, one of the reasons is because these are art forms with a very long tradition of responsive art making. And I want to lift up what you said about um, inviting these artists into your building. This is a great opportunity for your audiences and their audiences to meet each other. Um, and the other thing I'd, I would just like to offer as a, an example, um, the Bearded Ladies Cabaret have a long-standing relationship with the Wilma Theater in Philadelphia. We are the resident, theater, the resident cabaret company of the Wilma. Uh, and after um, the Orlando massacre, um, we were able to work with an intersectional group of other responsive artists that included uh, organizations like Out Muslim, um, a group uh, called, um, I'm gonna get this right, I'm gonna get it wrong because I'm not prepared, uh, Pangea, which is a Latinx artist organization, um, and a, a number of other individual artists, including an all lesbian rock band. Um, and the Wilma gracefully offered us space and so one way that I think institutions can work with these artists is to just pr provide them with the resources that you all have and trust us to make something that will be the kind of responsiveness that you want. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, Vivian, go ahead. Hey, uh, my name is Vivian. I use they, them pronouns. Um, an issue that I would like to raise in this space right now is um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to center my own community, but I do not mean to center myself in doing so because this applies to almost every axis of domination that I have dialogued with and communicated with. And that's, um, so if you look at the most recently commissioned study on uh, trans discrimination in the workplace, about 50% of trans people have faced overt ridicule or harassment for discrimination in the workplace, and about 78% report erasure or other forms of um, microaggressions, but beyond microaggressions, just sort of flatline non-acknowledgement, which is the most common form in, in my life and the life of many of my peers. And then you look at the numbers of theaters that participated in Ghostlight, which I believe was around 500. And in if you ask any of my friends, literally all of us who have worked in many of those theaters have faced pretty intense discrimination, uh, including myself, at major and small theaters. So who benefits from the social and financial capital of getting to say we did a ghost light <laughs> when you don't care about the employees that are in those spaces? Because at this point, just learning is not an adequate enough response. Yeah. And it's quite frustrating to, to hear about how much people care when it is so absent from the practice. Super great question. I'm so thankful that you brought that into the space. Thank you so much. Um, yes, down here. Let's get you a mic. Oh, I'm sorry, was there somebody else back there who was ready? Yes, I'm sorry, and then Hi. we'll come down to the front. Hello, okay, uh, Brad Rothbart, um, they, them. I just have to go back for a few minutes because I'm lucky enough to be on the board with Diane Brewer, and I'm lucky enough to have been trained by Leslie Eason. And any, there are people outside here, people in government, who want all of us dead, okay? It is very easy for a movement to move together when we are against something. It is much harder to do so when we're for something. So I don't think we should brush over conflict. I think we should talk about it. I think we should work it out. But I think there's a way to address the conflict and the problems of the work without attacking or jumping on the person who is, we are all stumbling, we are all figuring it out, we are all yeah. trying, we are all making mistakes. So let's keep it to the issues and not to the people. Thank you, Brad. Also, one last thing, personally, as a white male and, a, and an ally, I have no idea how to wake other white men up to the trauma that has been caused to indigenous folks and other marginalized folks without showing them images of that trauma. And that's my own struggle for right now. Thank you for saying that. Yes, please.
Thank you, Phaedra. Um, we had a we had a p- uh, person who wanted a mic down here. Go ahead. Hi, Kate Langsdorf. Uh, she, her, or they. Um, first of all, I love all you guys in this room. I think you're so great. Beyond that, when ta- thinking about responsive theater, um, I spent my l- I'm in LA now, but I spent my last ten or so years in the Washington D.C. theater community, and I also uh, walk with a cane. Don't do stairs so well, um, and I. V- appreciate and value that what you guys were all talking about and and what I experienced in DC is that when there was a responsive production it was either free or or very very low cost um what created a barrier to access for me was that because of that free access I couldn't get up the goddamn stairs because it was like in the the off brand community center basement I d- I, how many elevators and how many staircases do you need to get to the elevator key scenario? So, um, I want I, I, I'm a white lady, uh, super duper white, and I w- I really wanted to be able to participate in conversations about uh, like theatrical responses to Trayvon Martin, for example, is the one that comes to mind. But I but there wasn't a way physically in for me, and then there was not a way digitally in for me. I spend a lot of time on the internet. Um, and so I just want to want to uh, I just want to speak that out um, and, and think about what are the ways that we need to um, uh, get to the money, I think, to allow everybody to be to be um, involved because I want to be a better ally. I, if by not hearing those stories, I can't participate in you know the, the revolution the way that I w- as fully as I would like to. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yes, please. Hi, May Antio, she, her. So I would like to um, say that for me personally, with no power that I have, I would like to relieve anyone who does not think they can respond to not respond unless you're in the conversation. Why are you responding if you were not in the conversation? Perhaps it is the place to listen, to listen deeply. And it is, you know, we are like made to be makers, so we always gotta be in it. Mm-hmm. And we gotta always have like the, the checks of like, I'm doing this and this and this and this. Maybe you don't. Maybe you need to let the people who have done it. I'm sorry, but are there any theaters of color that have not been making responsive theater? Ha- have, can, can we name a theater? What, what, that's what we do, right? So, so to me, I'm really concerned by this idea of immediacy. Thank I'm you. I'm very concerned about this. And when we talk about things like we need to do something now, action without understanding is part of the capitalist system that is killing us. Thank you. Krishnamurti says, sorry, I'm still going. No, no, I'm, I'm going. encouraging you. Still Please going. keep going. <laughs> right? Krishnamurti says, I'm sorry, I'm going to paraphrase it, but the understanding of something will change it. And we take action too quickly. And so we don't understand the actions that we're taking. And I'm not saying don't act, but I'm saying we gotta understand first very deeply before we go, how do we respond? Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, Was there a, Kat, did you wanna? We have a couple minutes left. I'm really aware of time, although I'm also aware that this conversation cannot be contained by this time. So, Kat, go ahead. Yeah, yeah girl, preach. Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, there are, there are folks doing this work, have been, continue to, and I think it's, it's really, 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 really important to acknowledge that and to, to really interrogate, right, like, what is the impulse behind entering into it. Um, there's a book called Racial Capitalism, I think, uh, that I would encourage you all to, to look into. Um, and I think that uh, I just want to lift up what, what Allison said earlier, too, that this is something that should be at the core, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so uh, know that art equity was with us. Mm-hmm. Um, look into, you know, to um, anti-racism training uh, as well. And I think uh, something that uh, I know Ilana and I talked about uh, maybe bringing the LTC, the Latinx theater commons into it. Something that we're doing in recognition of the fact that we are not as inclusive 
uh, as we want to be. Um, and we need to really look at ourselves, or look damn hard in the mirror, um, and figure out why that is, that we are all on the steering committee committing to uh, taking anti-racism training together. Um, and when we recommitted uh, to be steering committee members for the coming year, um, you know, you sign the, this letter, of mm -hmm. this commitments, and the last question was, um, I commit, or the statement was, I commit to taking anti-racism training. And the options were yes or no, and I will be stepping down. Mm -hmm. And that is the kind of action required of each and every one of us. I think it's important for the board, for everyone who's in decision making, right? And I, this is something that theater companies, as far as I'm concerned, must implement. Thank you, Kat. Can I just add one? To, the Please. to Kat's list. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of research and Put information available yeah. on um, trauma-informed uh, training and trauma-informed best practices. So moving forward in works, I, do, I, I work with a lot of Native artists and we do a lot of um, indigenous work and um, being uh, trained in those uh, fields is not, not, not an option anymore. Um, and I just want to, uh, hi I write I've been writing down quotes all weekend, <laughs> so I just want to lift one of my favorite ones up that is uh, a tangent to May's comment. Um, and I hope, uh, Jen, I have your permission to say this, but uh, the quote was, listening is a radical act. And I think that identifying who we are and acknowledging that privilege, uh, that's sometimes the most radical thing we can do. Thank you. So, um, the constraints of the conference schedule tell us that this moment is coming to a close. I also want to say that this is not the end of the conversation on many, many different levels, and I'm aware that LMDA is trying to um, create more structures to continue exactly this kind of discussion. I also want, before we end, I want to pull together a couple of threads that I'm hearing. Um, one is, First, before anything else, I really want to thank the members of the panel and the audience um, who were doing some intense emotional and intellectual and artistic labor on behalf of the room. Um, that's really graceful and um, generous of you to do that. I also want to thank those of you who made yourselves vulnerable and explored and articulated things that um, perhaps were, um, were received with some friction in the room. Because I also think that together as dramaturgs, one of the things we must do is create spaces where people are allowed to be wrong um, or allowed to discover a path, whether that's wrong or not wrong. I think it's important, it's come up a couple times at this conference, that we embrace the notion of failure, that failure isn't a, a declaration of one's moral fiber, but rather it is a mark along the path, a process of growth, and that as we are talking, there I don't think there's a single person in this room who gets it right all the time, and there's a lot of us who get wrong a lot of the time, myself included. Um, so I want to thank those of you who made those moments vulnerable, and I also want to thank those of you who um, felt the desire to hold us to account in many different ways. These conversations about these subjects cannot happen unless we are all able to listen and to um, be brave about centering uh, uh, things that we may not be as familiar with as somebody else. So um, I, a huge thank you to our panel, um, including uh, Diane, thank you so much, and the rest of our panel. Um, thank you to the room and to those who are watching on HowlRound. And it seems that one of the, the, the things that's coming out of this is that responsiveness is important. The quality of how we respond and the notions of, of inclusivity and how universal that is need to be part of our conversations. So um, I hope that we will continue to talk about this as we move through the rest of our day. Thank you so much. <laughs>